I have gained over the past few weeks a deep appreciation of the topic that is set before us this evening. Uh, I have found most of uh, this appreciation has come about by the reading of this book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. This is an extraordinary book. This book was written by a man called John Fox. Uh, He was born in 1516 and he was a friend of one of the martyrs, Nicholas Ridley, that we will be speaking about uh, this evening. He was born in Lincolnshire, but he studied in Oxford in Brasenose College. And while at university, he was a devout Catholic. By the age of 25, he had mastered the Greek language, the Latin, uh, reading and writing in Latin, and also he knew Hebrew by the age of 25. And uh, John Fox, with that under his belt, began to study his Bible. In the studying of his Bible, he came to realise that the practices and the doctrines which he was accustomed to in his religion were not found in the Bible. This alarmed him. And through further study of the Bible, he came to the knowledge that Christ is the only one who can save and he put his faith and trust in Christ and he became a Christian. In 1553, when Mary I came to the throne, he ran away from the country knowing that persecution was coming. He fled to Europe. And in Europe, he continued what would be his life's greatest work, this book, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, He began to research the large numbers of Christians who had been martyred for their faith throughout history. When he left Europe in 1559, he came back to England after Mary had died and he continued in his work. He travelled the length and breadth of the country speaking to eyewitnesses and uh, inspecting official church documents regarding martyrdoms that had taken place while he was away. Uh, When he did return to England, he found that many, many of his friends had been martyred by the Queen. Friends like John Hooper, a great preacher and a great reformer, was burnt at Gloucester on the 9th of February 1555. Uh, A friend like John, John Rogers, who was again a great preacher and a great light of the Reformation, burnt on the 4th of February 1555. Uh, burnt in Smithfield, a great open area in the centre of London which was going to become well known for the burning of Christians. He continued and he compiled in 1570 the Fox's Book of Martyrs. I would heartily recommend this book to everyone here present. It has been described as the book, out, the only book outside of the Bible that can profoundly influence the life of a person. This evening we're going to consider the lives of three men. Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. They're known as the Oxford Martyrs because they were martyred in Oxford. They were martyred in a place, Fox in his book of uh, of martyrs describes it as that ditch over against Balliol College. And you can go to that place today. Uh, It's no longer a ditch, it's been tarmacked over. It is Broad Street. And uh, in the middle of Broad Street, you will see a yellow and black cobbled cross that has been sunk into the tarmac. On that spot, or very close to it, these three men were burnt for their faith in in 1555 and 1556. Uh, Just around the corner from Broad Street, uh, at the end of St. Giles, uh, if you walk around there, you will see uh, an imposing structure, a, a spire at the end of St. Giles. This is known as the Martyrs Memorial and it was set up in 1841 uh, as a memorial and a witness to those three men who died for their faith, burnt at the stake just around the corner in Broad Street. Why were they martyred? Well, they were martyred for the same reason that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. When we opened our Bibles earlier on, we read about these three men. Uh, Three men who loved God who followed God, who wanted to live according to the will of God. That's how their life was. But they were taken away from their country and they were landed in Babylon, a foreign country, surrounded by idolatry, uh, surrounded by statues and idols, uh, surrounded by a foreign religion. The king of that country, King Nebuchadnezzar, had made a decree that every single person, upon hearing various sounds of music, were to bow down before a statue that he had set up. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, 
refused to bow down to the idolatry of their day. And as a result, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. Now, if we, re- if we continued reading that account, we would have found how God marvellously rescued them from it. But did you hear their words? God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, know ye this, that we will not bow down to your statue. Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley were burnt at the stake for the same reason. They lived in a world that at that time was steeped in idolatry, uh, steeped in the worship of angels, steeped in the worship of saints who are dead and long gone, steeped in the worship of Mary. The culture was at that time steeped in idolatry. And these three men, Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley, refused to bow to the idolatry of their day. They refused the idolatrous doctrines of the supremacy of the Pope. To say that the Pope uh, was God's man on earth as a mediator between God and men. They had read their Bibles and they had come to an understanding and appreciation of what the Bible says, that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. They refused to bow to the idolatry of worshipping of saints as we've already mentioned. They had read their Bibles and they had come to an understanding and appreciation that they were to worship the Lord their God and him only should they serve. Uh, They refused to believe in a place called purgatory, uh, a place between heaven and hell where departed souls would be deposited until the praying and paying of people could fetch them out. They had read their Bibles and found that no such place existed. And they held to the truth that there is one heaven to gain and one hell to shun. And paramount, they refused to bow to the idolatrous doctrine of accepting that they need an additional sacrifice for their sins. Every time the Mass was performed in their day, a glass of wine was taken and a little wafer of bread was taken. And what was said is that this wine and this wafer turned into the literal blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so another sacrifice had taken place that needed to be applied to themselves for the dealing of their sins. They had read their Bible and they had found out with such great conviction that there is only one sacrifice of Jesus Christ for sins forever. No more sacrifices needed. Uh, That's something that every one of us in this meeting should be reminded of. There is one sacrifice for sins. My friend, if you want to be free from your sins, you need to look to Christ. He's the only sacrifice for sins, the only one able to save us from our sins. They refused to bow to the idolatry of their day. Now, if we're going to consider these three men, uh, we need to do a little bit of time travelling. Now, I enjoyed what we did a few weeks ago when Mervyn took us back in time to the time of William Tyndale. We're going to do the same again today. You need to come with me in your mind back in time 462 years. We find ourselves now in the year 1553. And as we travel back through time, we stop in the Tudor age. We find ourselves in Tudor London, Tudor architecture, Tudor culture, Tudor music. Walk with me now through London until we come to the borough of Greenwich. We're now at Greenwich and on the south bank of the uh, River Thames we see a palace. A great towering Tudor palace. It's called Greenwich Palace. We cross over and we go now to the door of that great palace. And we open up the oak doors and we step into the lobby. Great panelling on the walls, a great oak staircase that stretches up to the second floor. And as we take that staircase, we go up and we come to a corridor. We walk down that corridor, it's around 7.30, 7.45 in the evening now. It's dark and, and our path is lit by candles. And as we walk down this corridor, we come to another door. And it's a door of a bedroom. As we creep that door of the bedroom open, we enter into a darkened room lit again by candles, a fire roaring in the corner of the room, though it is July. And we see in the centre of the room a group of men huddled around a four-poster bed. As we approach that bed and that group of men, 
the atmosphere is silent and hushed. As we look into that bed, we see a young 15-year-old boy. He's struggling to breathe. His chest is, is heavy. He's coughing. He's, he's spluttering. He's lying out there in the bed and every eye is fixed upon him. And, and as a man at the head of that bed leans down to catch the final words of this young boy, he splutters and he coughs and he expires under the weight of tuberculosis. He's dead. This 15-year-old boy's name is Edward. Or to give him his full title, Edward the Sixth. King of England, Ireland and France, defender of the faith. We have just witnessed the death of the final Tudor king. Uh, there has been three of them. Uh, king Henry VII first stole the, th- the throne and, and the crown and became uh, king of England. That in turn was passed on to his son, Henry VIII. Henry VIII had one son, Edward. And now he is dead. The third and final Tudor king is gone. There will be no more. Now his two sisters will reign after him and will become two Tudor queens, but there will never again be a Tudor king. King Edward VI is dead. As we ponder the, the situation before us, the group of people are, some of them are weeping. Uh, Some of them are silent, but all of them are solemn. None more so than Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, one of our Oxford martyrs. Thomas Cranmer was there at every stage of Edward's life. He was there in the chamber the night he was born. Jane Seymour gave birth to this uh, young child, greatly rejoiced in the country. Here was finally the son that King Henry, Henry VIII had longed for. And he was paraded around Hampton Court Palace to great fanfare. And here Thomas Cranmer was there to witness it. Uh, he was there when Henry died. In fact, he was the one placing that crown on Edward's brow. At the coronation, there in Westminster Abbey, he placed that crown upon the head of Edward and proclaimed him Edward VI, King of England. Two great burdens were placed upon Edward the day he took the crown upon his head. He was nine years old. Uh, The first one, the first great burden that was placed upon him was the burden to be such a great king like his father. Now, we often think of Henry VIII as a man who had an insatiable desire to to receive and then dispatch wives. That's how we know him today. But in the day when Edward lived, he was known as King Henry the Great, a man of great power and wealth and influence and might and and a man of of decision and, and decisiveness, a great king. That burden laid heavy upon his brow. He longed to be like his father and it was his shame throughout the six years which he reigned to be a king within, uh, within a hand's grasp of bankruptcy. But the second and greater responsibility placed upon that nine-year-old king there in Westminster Abbey was that he should be Josiah-like in his reign. Now what does that mean? Thomas Cranmer preached it told him he should be like the biblical king Josiah, a boy who took the crown at at the same age, a boy king and yet a king who was mighty in the reforming of the nation. When Josiah became king, the whole nation was given over to idolatry. On every hill there was an altar to some unknown god. In every grove there was a place where people would go and worship idols and false gods. And Josiah, in the Bible, moved in the power of God to rid the land of idolatry and false religion. This burden was laid upon Edward by Thomas Cranmer. Told him, at the age of nine, that his reign should be one of reformation to rid the kingdom of idolatry and false religion. This was something that King Edward VI did and did very, very well. For such a young boy, he knew what he believed and he acted upon it and he devoted his small, short reign to ridding the land 
of much idolatry and false religion. Thomas Cranmer was also there when King Edward VI died and was buried. And Thomas Cranmer in Westminster Abbey took the funeral service for this great reforming king. At the same time, across the town, in the Tower of London, uh, Edward's sister, half-sister, her mother was uh, Catherine of Aragon, she was holding a private Catholic requiem mass for her brother Edward's soul. Edward was a great reformer, sweeping reforms, taking those uh, false doctrines and banishing them away, writing it into law that instead of the mass there should be the preaching of the gospel. That instead of Latin service in the church, services should be held and preached in English for people to understand. And many, many people who were never able to read the Bible came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because of those reforms. But on October the 1st, 1553, Mary was crowned Queen in Westminster Abbey. She was a staunch Catholic very, very different to that of her brother. She was crowned not by the Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, but by the convinced Catholic Bishop of Winchester, Stephen Gardner. Stephen Gardner had an absolute... He absolutely detested the Reformation and everything that came with it. Under the reign of King Edward VI, the Reformation flourished. What do I mean by the Reformation? I mean this. The doctrines of the Catholic Church which held people in bondage, which said you must confess to a priest, which said you must work for your salvation, which said there must be, you must bow the knee to the Pope as your intercessor to God, that said if you don't work enough you'll never be in heaven and you'll be in purgatory. All of those doctrines were swept away And true biblical doctrines were brought out and widely publicised. So that where there was the need under the old regime to work for your salvation, now the wonderful gospel was preached. And it went forth to tell men and women that through faith alone in Jesus Christ, your sins can be forgiven. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone was the official word from the throne and from the church under the days of Reformation. Wonderful openness of scriptures, people being able to read it in their own language, to have a Bible upon their lap, to hear it preached in their own language, to come to Christ and to be saved. But all that was about to change. Within the first year of her reign, Queen Mary had restored almost all the Catholic bishops which were removed by Edward. She returned the church doctrine to Catholic pre-reformed state. So she got rid of all that biblical preaching. The preaching of the gospel was hidden. Uh, A Bible in English was forbidden. Uh, Preaching in English was forbidden. Back came the Latin Mass. Back came the foreign Bible. Back came words that men and women, just like you and I, were unable to understand. Back came the darkness of that religion. And what followed uh, with it, as she brought it in, she had always rejected also her father's break with Rome. Uh, If you remember from school days, King Henry VIII, he desired to have a divorce and that wasn't working out for him. And so he cut ties with the Pope that denied it and he set up his own church. She had always detested that and always felt that that, that the nation should be brought back uh, under Roman Catholic jurisdiction. Uh, She appealed to Parliament in her reign to repeal Henry's religious law. And they did. And that meant that England had now returned fully under Roman jurisdiction. Uh, Pope Julius III was overjoyed to see the straying sheep that was England come back to the Catholic fold. He he had a, a special coin minted specifically for the occasion and distributed it throughout the whole uh, empire. He was overjoyed and she was welcomed as that great mouthpiece of the church, that great ambassador of the church bringing back the nation that had strayed. In 1554, the Pope and the Queen approved the revival of the Heresy Act, which was previously outlawed by Edward VI 
and King Henry VIII. These were a set of uh, archaic medieval laws that clamped down very, very harshly on anyone convicted of heresy. It was outlawed under the previous two reigns, and yet Mary, under authority from the Pope, brought it back into this nation. And so now, very harsh penalties, the chiefest of which was being burnt at the stake, was now perfectly legal for a person found guilty of heresy before a church council. We need to remember now that all of those church councils were headed by Catholic bishops who hated and detested the Reformation that was brought in years before. And so now all of these people who had found faith in Christ under the glorious Reformation were now in serious trouble of uh, their safety. At the persecution by Mary was far-reaching and barbaric. I want to read a quote from Arthur Atherstone's book, The Martyrs of Mary Tudor. In it, this is what he writes, quote, During the reign of Queen Mary Tudor, the fires of martyrdom blazed across England. In less than four years, between uh, February 1555 and November 1558, nearly 300 Protestant Christians were burned to death for their faith. Uh, Such was the ferocity of the persecution that the Queen has has been known ever since as Bloody Mary. Her brief occupation of the throne has gone down in history as England's reign of terror. Those, Those terrible 45 months had a profound impact upon the future direction of Christianity and the British Isles. It was far reaching. The martyrs came from every social class and every walk of life. Some were eminent, including four bishops and an archbishop. Sixteen were clergymen, including a number of prominent preachers. But more often than not, those who died were unknown gentry or tradesmen. They included weavers, fishermen, tailors, barbers, upholsterers, brewers, carpenters and agricultural labourers. Often illiterate and unlearned, apart from their knowledge of Christ and their love for the Bible, one in five of the martyrs were women. They were elderly widows and teenage girls. Those blind, frail or disabled found no leniency. To admit to Protestant convictions was now a matter of life and death. That means if you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, you would be burnt at the stake. Uh, That means if you believe that your sins could only be dealt with by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, shed once and for all at Calvary, you would be burnt at the stake. 300 almost, almost 300 of these Christians, believers, just like you and I, were barbarically burnt at the stake. Three ladies were burned on the island of Guernsey. John Fox, in his Book of Martyrs, writes a harrowing account, and I want to read it to you, it's very brief, I want to read it to you just so we can understand not only that the persecution was widespread, but that it was barbaric to its very core. On the 18th of July, 1556, Peritine Massey was great with child, but she was burnt at the stake. And being great with child, the belly of the woman burst asunder by the vehemence of the flame. The infant, being a fair man-child, fell into the fire. The baby was rescued, but the bailiff ordered that it should be carried back again and cast into the fire. The reign of Queen Mary, just a few years, produced some of the worst persecution Christians have ever known. And of those Christians who were persecuted, some of those shining lights we're considering this evening. Thomas Cranmer, our first martyr, although he actually was martyred last, uh, Thomas Cranmer was born in Aslacton, Northamptonshire, in 1489. He studied in Cambridge and he became a fellow of Jesus College. Uh, He was greatly celebrated for his learning and for his abilities. He was a a, a great intellectual. Uh, He was a man who knew several languages. In March 1533, he was made Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, Before he was appointed to that position, he had travelled in Europe. And as he was travelling in Europe, he came into contact with the European reformers. 
He read books by Luther. Uh, He met many of those reformers on the continent who were changing their nation and the established religion of their land by opening up the Bible and making it available to you and I and people uh, just like us. When he came back from Europe, he was made Archbishop of Canterbury by King Henry VIII and he was zealously attached to the glorious cause of Reformation. That's what he said about himself. But on the ascension of Mary, he was thrown into the Tower of London. Why was he thrown into the Tower of London? He was arrested and he was thrown into the Tower of London because of his great Reformation work. Uh, He did much as the Archbishop of Canterbury to change the way in which churches operated in this land. He brought out two copies of the Common Book of Prayer. This is an instruction manual, really, of how church services were to be carried out. He found it restrictive to reform under the reign of King Henry VIII. But when he had died and Edward had taken the throne, Edward gave him free reign to publish as many pro-Reformation books as possible. And he did. He did away completely with the Catholic Mass. Uh, He he did away with much uh, false doctrines that were uh, associated at that time with the church. And he brought out the preaching of the gospel. He uh, encouraged the preaching of the gospel. He encouraged Bible study. And he encouraged souls to look to Christ alone to have their sins forgiven. When Queen Mary came to the throne, he was thrown into the Tower of London. We're going to leave him in the Tower of London and we're going to go all the way back to Thurkston in Leicestershire in 1475 and we're going to see a crying baby by the name of Hugh Latimer. That's when he was born, that's where he was born. Uh, He was also educated in Cambridge. In fact, all of the martyrs, the Oxford martyrs, were educated in Cambridge. They were burnt at Oxford, but they were educated at Cambridge. Uh, He was a zealous papist. He was a Roman Catholic. And he was a Roman Catholic with such zeal uh, that he he drew likeness to Saul of Tarsus in his zeal to persecute those who were outside of what he perceived to be God's will. Saul of Tarsus in the Bible, he hated Christians and he went out to persecute them until he was converted to Christ and then he became a great preacher of the faith he once laboured to destroy. The same happened for Hugh Latimer. He was zealous in his Catholic faith and yet through talking to a man called Thomas Bilney who spoke often to him, he was convinced that the only way his sins could be forgiven was directly through Christ and his sacrifice upon the cross. And he became a Christian and he became one of the greatest preachers of the Reformation that has ever lived. Uh, He uh, preached to King Henry VIII. He preached to King Edward VI. One day he was given the position, he became a Bishop of Worcester in 1533 and he was a fearless preacher. On New Year's Day at that time it was the custom that all the bishops throughout the land would take a gift to the king, King Henry VIII. All the bishops surrounding him uh, brought little bags full of money hoping that as they would give in the same manner they would receive. Not giving at all. Hugh Latimer gave the king a New Testament. Not only a New Testament, but he had folded the page in that New Testament where this verse was written. Whoremongers and adulterers shall God judge. And he handed it to King Henry VIII. He was a fearless preacher of the gospel. He was a great reformer. And yet... When Queen Mary came to the throne, he was thrown into the Tower of London and he joined Thomas Cranmer. Uh, We're going to leave him there and we're going to go now uh, to Northumberland. 1500 is the year and we're going to see that here was a man named Nicholas Ridley born into his family. Born in 1500 in Northumberland, he studied in Newcastle upon Tyne before going again to Cambridge. Uh, All of these chaps, they knew each other at Cambridge and they shared their ideas and they they forged a a lasting friendship uh, amid the corridors of Cambridge University. Uh, He was saved out of Catholicism under the preaching of Thomas Cranmer. Uh, He became the Bishop of Rochester and later he became the Bishop of London and uh, he took it upon himself in that good position there in the centre of London again 
to help uh, very much in the publishing of reformed works, in the publishing abroad of the gospel and of the sweeping aside of false doctrines. Uh, He also was imprisoned in the Tower of London by Queen Mary. All of these Oxford martyrs, Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, along with another man named John Bradford, shared the same cell in the Tower of London. They thanked God every single day that the prison was so crowded they had to share a cell together. Because every day they spent their time studying the Bible, encouraging each other in the faith, uh, singing praises unto God, strengthening each other through the scriptures. And they often looked at their time together in the Tower of London as a time of great blessing and a time of great rejoicing. These four men were in the Tower of London until three of them were moved to Bocardo Prison in Oxford. It's no longer there, it's been demolished. It was on uh, the city wall and uh, it's been demolished. Uh, But you can still go to, I think it's St Mary's Church, and you can see the door to their cell that is still on display today. You can go and you can see it. John Bradford was taken to a different prison and uh, soon he and a young man named Mr Leaf who was an apprentice tallow chandler, were taken to Smithfields and they were burnt at the stake for their faith in 1555. John Bradford would look to the young man, 19 years of old, Mr Leaf beside him, and he would say, Be of good comfort, brother. We shall have a merry supper with the Lord tonight. And he was set alight. In Oxford... Uh, These three men, Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley, they shared a cell for a short period of time before Cranmer was moved somewhere else and Nicholas Ridley was moved to live with a family under house arrest. Cranmer, he he was found guilty and he was degraded. That means he was stripped of his position, physically stripped of his robes. He he was degraded and at his degradation, because he was found uh, to be guilty, Uh, the death sentence should have followed soon after. But it didn't. Because every attempt was made to make the former Archbishop of Canterbury shake in his faith, recant of his reformed doctrines and to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. And great effort and pressure was put upon him in order to cause him to recant. And while all of this is going on, he is being taken and he is being tortured. He's being degraded in the lowest possible form. He is being tortured uh, beyond words, physically. Uh, He's being kept in solitary confinement. Uh, He's being kept in such conditions it would make you and I shudder even to see it today. And then he was pulled out of such low and horrific circumstances and he was allowed to live with a dean of a college in great opulence and luxury. Uh, amid great conversation and educated people. And when he had been there a few weeks, he would be taken back to the hovel of the pit in the prison where he was. And he would be again tortured and crushed and bruised. And this would happen again and again and again in their efforts to wear this man down. While that was going on, Ridley and Latimer were being called before a church council in the School of Divinity in Oxford. They were found guilty and they were forbidden from answering the charges against them. Uh, They were, of course, in prison. They were under arrest. But it was the law that if they were found uh, guilty or if they were in trial, if they could present themselves before the Pope within 80 days, then he would hear their cause. Of course, this was impossible. They were under lock and key in Oxford. And so sentence was passed upon these two godly men that they should be burnt at the stake. That happened on the 30th of September, 1555. The day before they were burnt at the stake, on the 16th of October, 1555, uh, Ridley sat down to have his last supper, so to speak, with the family uh, under which he was with house arrest. His hostess, she began to break down in tears and she began to cry at what was going to take place the next morning. They were going to be burnt at the stake. She began to break down and cry, but Ridley with such a cheerful voice, looked at her and said, Weep not for me, for though my breakfast may be somewhat bitter and hurtful, I am confident that my supper will be much more merry. He was talking about his supper with the Lord. 
That breakfast of the burning outside of Balliol College that was going to take place the next day. He looked past it and he looked to the great supper he was going to enjoy with his Lord and Saviour that evening in heaven. What a great confidence uh, to have. Uh, They were led out from their prison early on the 16th of October. Ridley first, uh, Latimer walking slowly behind. He was an older man. Late 60s, Latimer was 50 years of age, was Nicholas Ridley. Uh, Walking to the place, uh, after some time they came to, as Fox said and we mentioned earlier, the ditch over against Balliol College. Uh, They came to that place where there was a great crowd already assembled. Uh, As they came into the area, Ridley entered that area first and he ran up to the stake, he embraced it and he kissed it. He knew now that he was going to seal his gospel preaching with his blood. As he turned, he saw Latimer with his hands up to heaven and a cheerful look upon the old man's face. Ridley ran to him and he embraced him. They were commanded now to ready themselves uh, for the burning. This took place after a short sermon uh, of just about 15 minutes uh, by the, uh, bishop, the Catholic Bishop of Oxford. Uh, they were forbidden to answer that sermon. They were now told to ready themselves for the burning. They began to undress. Uh, They took their clothes off and they remained only in a long shirt that hung down to their knees. Uh, This was Latimer. He gave all of his clothes to the poor. Those poor people standing around, he would hand his neckerchief and his hat and his shoes and so on. Ridley said to Latimer, I thought it best if I kept my trousers on. Uh, Latimer looked at Ridley and said, No, the burning of them will cause you much pain. Besides, they will do a poor man much good. With that, he took them off, still dressed in his long shirt, and he handed them to a poor man beside him. They were now moved to the stake. Bundles of reeds and grass and sticks were piled around their feet and uh, from one side came Ridley's brother-in-law. He came up to Ridley and uh, he began to fasten something around his neck. Uh, Ridley asked what it was. A leather pouch of gunpowder was the answer. Ridley said, then I accept it from the Lord. Do you have any for my brother? Pointed to Latimer. Uh, Ridley's brother-in-law said, yes, I do. He said, Do it quickly before you're too late. And he came to Latimer and he attached also a similar uh, leather pouch around his neck. Now it was time for burning. Latimer looked at Ridley and he says this, Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust will never be put out. A bundle of sticks was lit and thrown at the feet of Ridley. The fire caught and soon it began to burn around their feet and around their legs. Latimer was heard to cry out, O Heavenly Father, receive my spirit. And he he, he continued uh, saying those same words until he fell silent and he was martyred. Ridley, unfortunately, was not was not in the same position. Uh, due to the, the incompetence of the person who had made the fire, on the side where Ridley was, the flames burnt the reeds and the sticks around his legs, but they would not proceed up his torso and to his head. He began to cry out in great pain. They were chained to the stake. And crying out in great pain, uh, his same brother-in-law, who had handed him the leather pouch, ran to his aid, and yet he did it in a way that was so misguided. He picked up a whole bunch of these uh, reeds and twigs, and he began to pile them around the torso and the neck and the face of Nicholas Ridley. Rather than speed up the flames, these bunches of reeds and twigs were still green, and so they would not catch fire. All they did was to suppress the flames further around his legs and around his feet. He could hardly move his head. As he cried out, the words you can read 
in Fox's Book of Martyrs, he cried out with a loud voice, hardly moving his head, I cannot burn! I cannot burn! Finally, a soldier swatted those twigs, those bundles of of reeds from the man and Ridley, seeing the flames uh, raise up on one side, leaned into the flames until finally he fell down at the feet of Hugh Latimer, his body having divided. His legs had turned to charcoal and he fell down at the feet of his brother, Hugh Latimer. Watching all of this, from his cell window was Thomas Cranmer, a man who knew the same fate was before him. Uh, Thomas Cranmer had been moved, as we've already discussed, from the prison uh, to the house, from the house to the prison, from the prison to the house, again and again and again. He had had the best of scholars, uh, Catholic scholars, come to him and, and try to reason with him and try to get him to change his mind and to turn away from what they saw was error back home to the Catholic Church. Save your life, they would say. Recant and be saved. But Thomas Cranmer was already saved. His sins were already forgiven. And yet, that uh, constant barrage of assault and torture and mental pressure took its toll on Thomas Cranmer until finally he called for a piece of paper on which was written a recantation. And he took a quill with his right hand and he signed it. Uh, He was signing away all the work that he had accomplished during the Reformation. Uh, He was signing away uh, all the truths that he had preached during his time as Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, He was signing to show now his allegiance to the Pope, his embracing of Catholic doctrines, of his uh, faith now, not in Christ but in the Mass. He had signed it all. This had finally taken its toll upon this old man. But Thomas Cranmer, when that cell door was closed and he was left alone said these words. He said, The anguish and the agony of my conscience due to the signing of that recantation was far more painful to him than any physical abuse he had experienced while in jail for the last three years. He had found himself now as as an enemy still to those who would have him a martyr and yet a traitor to those whom he loved and and preached the gospel to. He found himself in the middle in such anguish of conscience that he could not escape. He was was called before uh, this Bishop Gardner came in to see him and uh, Thomas Cranmer, according to the law, should have been pardoned. If you are a, a heretic and you sign a recantation and you now affirm that you uh, want to be reconciled with the Catholic Church, in the law of the land, you are free to live. And yet Queen Mary, who detested this man to such a degree because he played a part in King Henry VIII's divorce from her mother, Catherine of Aragon, was uh, so bitter towards this man that she would not give him forgiveness. And she had determined that he should be burnt at the stake. She wanted to, him to be absolutely humiliated. And so, what the, com- the, so the, the command was given that he, a little while after this uh, recantation was signed, three pieces of paper were put before him. Uh, one of them was his recantation, which he signed. Uh, two of them were blank pieces of paper upon which he was to write his confession of how he has finished with reformed doctrines and turned back again to the Catholic Church. He was to write one and to give it to the bailiff. Uh, He was to write another and put it in his pocket ready to read out. Uh, He signed the recantation. He wrote his confession and he gave it to the bailiff. He wrote on the third piece of paper, folded it up and put it in his pocket. He was led out the very next day to St. Mary's Church uh, where he was set up, uh, where, he was, uh, where he was put on display like an animal and uh, 
many, many people filed into that church to see now the signed recantation of the former Archbishop of Canterbury and bright light of the Reformation and also to hear him read those degrading words of grovelling forgiveness back to the Roman church. Uh, He stood before him uh, he stood there before the people while the Bishop of Oxford, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Cole, preached his sermon. Uh, he preached about the king and the queen. Uh, he preached about faith. He preached about doctrines. But most of his sermon was taken up in offensive words directed towards Mr. Cranmer. Uh, Mr. Cranmer now, it was his time to speak. As he took now to the platform, ready to speak... He got out that piece of paper which was in his pocket. It was a great long document. Uh, It it contained a whole ream of things which he held to uh, whether he was a Protestant or a Catholic. So he spoke about faith in God. Uh, He spoke about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, He spoke about a whole ream of things written down on his piece of paper. But the piece of paper he took from his pocket and the piece of paper in the bailiff's hand were different. Different in only a few paragraphs, but vitally different. I'm going to read you here an excerpt from Fox's Book of Martyrs, and with this uh, we'll very quickly close. Thomas Cranmer began to read uh, the note that he had written. But when he got down to his last few paragraphs, knowing that the stake lay before him, Seeing the great testimony of his brethren, uh, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, who had gone so faithfully to the stake, he read these words with such vigour before the priests and before the bishops and before the people who had assembled themselves to see the degradation and humiliation of Thomas Cranmer. He says this as he gets down uh, into his note. He says, And now I come to what troubleth my conscience more than anything that ever I did or said in my life. And that is the setting abroad of a writing contrary to the truth, which now here I renounce and refuse, as written with my hand indeed, but contrary to what I thought in my heart, and written for fear of death, to save my life, if it might be. All such papers which I have written or signed since my degradation I renounce as untrue, And for as much as my hand hath offended in the signing of the recantation, it shall first be punished. For when I come to the fire, it shall first be burned. And as for the Pope, I refuse him with all his false doctrines as Christ's enemy and as Antichrist. And as for the sacrament, I believe as I have taught in my book against the Bishop of Winchester, The doctrine of my book teacheth shall stand at the last day before the judgment of God where this papistical doctrine shall be ashamed to show his face. The final words of Thomas Cranmer were those of utter defiance to the Roman Catholic Church. He renounces his, his recantation. He announces that the hand which signed that recantation, that that wretched hand which offended, shall be burnt first. He speaks about the sacrament that he was forced now to sign that he believed it becomes the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ. He renounces it. He says no such thing takes place. There is no more sacrifice for sins. Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary was once and for all. It deals with sins. And if a man does not have dealings with Jesus Christ, then a man is not forgiven of his sins. Thomas Cranmer was rudely torn down from that stage and taken again to the ditch over against Balliol College. He was chained to the stake. This man now, who was once clothed in such regal attire as the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, was now in some pauper's clothes, strapped uh, by his uh, waist, by a, a chain, to a stake in the middle of a ditch. Reeds laid around him. They were lit and thrown at his feet. The fire ascended. He held out his right hand and cried, The hand that offended, it shall burn first. 
John Fox in the book of Martyrs says this, he held it there and he continued to repeat those words until his hand turned in to charcoal and the fire ascended up his body and Thomas Cranmer became a martyr in 1556. Why was it that these men were willing to give their lives? These men had a confidence of what lied beyond death for them. We remember the words of John Bradford. Be of good comfort, for tonight we shall have a merry supper with the Lord. We think of the words of Nicholas Ridley. Though my breakfast be somewhat harsh and bitter, I am confident that my supper shall be far more merry. These were men who were willing to seal what they preached with their blood because they were confident that through Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that only he can bring, eternity to them held nothing but God's open hand and heart of pleasure and God's presence forever. They would not trade Christ for a ceremony. Uh, They would not trade Christ for a rite. They would not trade Christ for a religion. Because Christ to them and Christ to every single believer throughout the ages, wherever they may be, even here today in Fringford Village Hall, Christ to the believer in Christ is precious and lovely, and the saviour of time and eternity. I wonder, do you have him as your saviour? We have brought our Sunday meeting out to the village hall. Why? So that we might tickle your ears and entertain you with a few minutes of history. No. That we might show those truths that were held to by these three men and almost 300 people like them who gave their lives during the persecution under which they were burnt at the stake, that the, that the ideas, the scriptural principles, the faith that they have in Jesus Christ might be your faith too. Now we might never be called upon to give our lives in such a manner and we pray that we never are. But however we exit this life, if our sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ and the precious blood which he shed upon the cross of Calvary, we can be absolutely assured and confident of heaven. I wonder if you have that confidence. That confidence can come no other way than through Jesus Christ. No religion can bring it. Uh, No uh, good behaviour can bring it. No upstanding character can bring that confidence. But Jesus Christ can bring it. Do you have it? Have you ever been saved from your sins? Do you have the confidence of eternity that spans before you to know that if tonight your soul was to depart from your body and your heart would beat no more, you would have the confidence of being with Christ, which is far better. May God bless you for listening. Absolutely.